Hey everyone, welcome to Ripstop on the Record, the episode for makers by makers coming straight to you from the Ripstop studios here in Durham, North Carolina. I'm Jameson. On today's episode, we will be talking about Polar Tech. That's right, the world famous, well renowned, coveted apparel fabric, Polar Tech. Ripstop is now going to be stocking six variants of this incredible fabric, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to ask you to like, rate, subscribe, comment, review, whatever it is you need to do to let other people know that this is an awesome place for makers, as well as just let us know if you like the episode. We want to know what to do better and how we can change and if people are enjoying it. So let us know. Now, for today's episode, there's two sections. First, Isaac and I will be talking about the variants that we're bringing on. We'll talk about things like the weight, the variant codes, as well as attributes and colors, things like that, so you can know the product line that we'll be bringing on. And second, we're going to be talking with a series of makers that have a lot of experience making apparel. Avery and I will be interviewing Tim from Learn MYOG, Sam from Sam Bob, as well as Connor from Hightail Designs. All these makers have awesome experience when it comes to working with these different variants from Alpha to Power Grid to the Polar 100 and 200. And these makers are gonna give you tips and tricks on how to be more successful when making with these fabrics. So stay tuned for all of it. This is an awesome episode. And uh, yeah, let us know what you're most excited to make with Polar Tech. Hey everyone, Jameson here. So I'm sitting in the studio with Isaac now, and we're going to release the six brand new Polar Tech variants. Isaac, welcome to the episode. What's up? Uh, Isaac, you've been working on this for quite a long time. you the person working on it the longest and the hardest. Uh, how does it feel to finally have these variants released to the open? Uh, it feels pretty amazing, not going to lie. Uh, I'm pretty sure I started talking with Polar Tech in July of 2022. Uh, so like six months at this point um, to like figure out what we wanted to get, talk with Polar Tech, figure out pricing, figure out how much we wanted to get. And then to finally re receive everything, it, it took a while. Um, but yeah, I'm stoked to be able to offer some really cool colors that uh, you guys probably won't be able to find anywhere else and some variants that I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's gonna be really cool. This is uh, Ripstop's kind of foray into the apparel market, and we're really pumped. We have some really cool people around. There's another episode that you'll hear. Um, you'll hear later on the episode some of the people I talked to you about how to make apparel. Um, so we're really trying to pull out all the stops and help you guys get ready for apparel making. Now, let's chat about the products that we have brought on. There's kind of three sections, if you will. There's the Polar Tech 100-200, kind of your standard fleece, if you want to call it that. Uh, there's a power grid, which is similar to the Patagonia, Patagonia R1 product line. And then there's Alpha Direct, which if you don't know what it is, we'll explain it here in just a second. So starting with the Polar Tech 200, Isaac, can you give us the details on this fabric? Yeah, for sure. So the 200 series is most likely uh, what you're going to be familiar with when it comes to fleece. This is probably similar in weight to what you felt if you've gone to your local uh, fabric store, whether that's Joann's or um, I don't even know any Lobby of Lobby. Lobby Lobby. Yeah, like whatever, wherever you've gone to feel fleece, uh, generic fleece, this is probably similar in weight to that. Um, this is kind of the the catch-all fleece. Um, it, it comes in at 8.1 ounces per square yard, um, and it's great for your generic fleece applications. Like if you're going to make a, you know, a, a fleece pullover or like um, if you're going to make a, a like fleece stuff sack for your electronics or like a lantern or, um, delicate boxers. items, fleece boxers. Yeah. All those would be great applications for the, the 200 series of fleece. Got to keep your core warm, you know, even if it's core down under, yeah. but, uh, this fleece is probably similar to like the Patagonia Cinchilla or like the snap tee. Those are the popular sweatshirts that are out nowadays, right? Yep. For sure. Uh, I have a, uh. Never mind. Cut that out. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, so that's the 200. There's a similar fabric, just a lighter version, which is called the Polar Tech 100. Mm -hmm. uh, how much lighter is that one? So it's half the weight, and it comes in at 4.1 ounces per square yard. Um, and this is – so the 100 series, to me, reminds me of my footy pajamas when I was a kid. <laughs> um, it's kind of like that just – 
light feeling, very soft fleece. Um, if you've ever put your hand into a jacket pocket that's lined with fleece, it's probably the 100 series fleece. That's good to know. So this is, there's a lot of like auxiliary applications you can use with some of these fabrics, but especially the Polar Tech 100 yeah. for, like you said, like electronic cases and glasses cases and things like that kind of those types of deal. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, liners for jackets. Um, this would probably be a good, if you were going to make like a sleeping bag liner or just a fleece sleeping bag, um, this would probably be a good weight for that. All right. So that's a good transition. Let's talk about the power grid now. Like I said earlier, similar to the Patagonia R1 series, um, more breathable than the 100 and 200 uh, standard fleece. What does the power grid offer? So the power grid kind of comes in in between the 100 and 200 at 6.6 .6 ounces per square yard. Uh, so it's a little heavier than the 100, obviously lighter than 200, but it does combine some, some other features that make it, uh, I guess, punch above its weight, so to speak. Um, the kind of the grid pattern or the, the waffle pattern, um, really allows it to trap in heat while also, uh, being more breathable than just the velour fleece. Um, I have a, uh, like a three quarter zip that I was issued in the army. Uh, we, we call it our waffle tops. Um, it's like a, like a midweight. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a three quarters zip midweight thermal. Um, and it's just great to like throw on if you know you're going to be sweating soon, right? Like if I'm going out for a paddle or for a, a hike or whatever it is that I know, you know, it's going to be kind of chilly, but I also will be sweating soon. That's what I throw on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent of the R1 series and I'm really pumped that we're getting this one in because especially I find this fleece to be nice for activity-based accessories. Like um, I'm kind of a headband wearer while running because uh, you can keep your ears warm, but you can actually breathe through your head. Or if it's really cold, the power grid as a beanie is also really nice. A lot of beanies just get too warm when you're running for, for a while. So yeah. huge, uh, huge proponent of this grid fleece for, for active wear type of thing. All right, which brings us to the Alpha Direct. Um, one of the hottest apparel fabrics on the market, if I can say that. I mean, yeah. I was... Uh, Arcteryx is using Alpha Direct. Cycling companies like Velocio use Alpha Direct. It's kind of everywhere, uh, but as well as uh, more cottage type companies like Hightail and other wonderful people. Um, so Alpha Direct is probably not going to be as familiar to people, and there's not a direct product that we can point to. And be like, oh, it's like this. How would you explain Alpha Direct to someone that's never seen it before? So Alpha Direct. Um, so let me back up just a little bit. There's two. Uh, kind of types of, of alpha. There was the original alpha that was developed by Polar Tech in, uh, in conjunction with uh, the military. Um, and they use that as like a, an insulation for like the inside of jackets. Um, and that if you know what alpha is or you have seen it before, then you've probably seen it as a liner on higher end jackets. Um, I have an outdoor research, I think it's a helium hoodie possibly. Uh, that is lined with the the alpha and it's basically, so if you think of like our synthetic insulation or any synthetic insulation, uh, whether it's, um, climb a, shield. climb a shield or any of those, think of that, but kind of pulled out a little bit more and stabilized so that you can sew with it. <clears throat> so think of like a, uh, like an interwoven, um, almost like, honey bee hive type structure of synthetic fibers, if that makes sense. So tell me if this is right, Isaac, but what keeps people warm is loft, right? And yeah. why climate shield works is because you're able to create loft between the insulation, the climate shield, whatever weight you're using between your jackets. Alpha produces loft at an extremely low weight and a very packable size, yeah. right? But if you're catching on to the drift here of what alpha is, if it's really open, a lot of loft, but really packable, it's also really loose, which means yep. it's very breathable, <laughs> too breathable sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So if you are, um, if you're using this in any situation where there's uh, a breeze, like any more, any more than like a mile per hour breeze, you're going to feel it. Um, so alpha direct is great for throwing on in very high, uh, respiration rate activities. Um, so like if you're running or you're hiking or, 
know, anything where you're like, you're moving quickly, alpha direct is, uh, is the way to go because as soon as you stop, um, it's going to, it's still lofted. So it's going to keep you warm. Um, but if you're in any kind of inclement weather, it's great to pair with a, a lighter weight, uh, rain layer or wind shell or something like that. Made even more interesting by the fact that we have a wool variant. Tell us about that. Yeah. One. So the, the alpha direct with wool, uh, the product code for that is going to be four zero four eight. Um, let me see the weight here. So the it comes in at four and a half ounces per square yard, which is uh, 0.5 ounces per square yard heavier than the four zero zero eight variant, which does not have wool. Um, but Alpha Direct with wool just kind of combines all the the cool aspects of Alpha Direct with the cool aspects of you know, natural wool, uh, properties. So, uh, it's going to keep you warm when it's wet or warmer when it's wet. Um, it's going to be naturally antimicrobial. It's going to be, um, just stronger than your typical, uh, you know, weight, uh, whether it's like Merino or whatever, uh, shirt, it's going to be stronger than that. I'm glad you mentioned the antimicrobial properties because the power grid is also finished with an antimicrobial, uh, spray, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know for certain that it's a spray or what kind of finish it is, but it is a, uh, an odor resistant, uh, coating. Forgot to mention that for the power grid. Um, cool. So that's the alpha direct with wool, really cool, a little bit heavier, but you know, all the amazing properties of wool. Now we've got two other variants of the alpha direct, a lighter and a heavier. What does the lighter one look like? So the lighter one is going to be the four zero zero four. Um, and that comes in at two and a half ounces per square yard, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. Think about it. Um, yeah, that's very lightweight. Um, it's going to be great for like that early fall, early spring, um, jaunt in the woods, uh, or, as a uh, ultralight system to pair with, uh, you know, heavier weight insulation or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's going to be both of those, the, the four zero zero four and four zero zero eight are going to be just really good options for making hoodies or, uh, sleeping pad covers or anything that, that requires a lightweight fabric, but, you also need to have uh, insulative properties. So if you want something a little bit more durable than the 4004, we do have the 4008 at four ounces. Are there any other features that the 4008 would offer that the 4004 would not? Um, I mean, just simply by the fact that it's a little heavier, it's going to provide more insulation. Um, but if you're really looking for that ultra light uh, hoodie, then, you know, obviously go for the 4004. And if you want a little more warmth at the cost of a little more weight, then go for the, the medium weight option. Cool. So let's chat colors. This is six fabrics now, yep. um, with a lot of different options and stuff. What sort of colors are we stocking right now? And then what, what might we be looking at in the future? So most of these are going to have just one, uh, color option. And that's mainly because, as Jameson said earlier, like this is our, our first foray into the apparel world. So uh, we kind of want to just make sure that it's going to go well first before we start stocking uh, all the colors known to man. Especially weird uh, stuff like Alpha Directed Wool is not that popular. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally love wool. And I think that everyone should love wool. But we don't know that for a fact. So we're, we're going kind of safe with that one uh, and just offering one color. Uh, but let's see. So the... The power grid is going to be the obviously the most color options. Um, that's what we're offering our fleece beanie kit in, um, and that is going to be uh, burnt orange, dark olive, Moroccan blue, sage, purple haze, purple haze, and cool gray. <laughs> you were already on the haze. <laughs> I was on the haze. On the haze yeah. <laughs> um, the sage and purple haze colors are are really cool. If I must say myself. Are those ones that you created, Isaac? <laughs> the, the No, the Sage is one that Carter and I uh, kind of worked on together to create. And then Purple Haze is one that I think Carter made a while ago. I think I helped name the Sage one, didn't I? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, so we all had a hand in that one. <laughs> um, let's see. And then 
What about the Polar Tech 100 200? Are there multiple colors in that one? So for now, Polar Tech 100 is just going to be a cool gray, which is like a, a lighter gray um, color, and then 200 will be dark gray. And that's we kind of did that just so that you have some uh, some options there as far as using it in various applications. Gray kind of goes with a lot of different things. So cool. So what that means for you all listening is if you really like these fabrics, then uh, going to shamelessly plug, go buy them and buy a lot of them because that'll tell us that we need to get more colors. Yeah. If you're interested in certain colors, then let us know. Shoot us a message or comment on Instagram. And let us know what colors you'd like to see. Um, and just the best thing you can do is let people know that we have these fabrics so that we can keep stocking them and we can get more colors. Yeah, I, I will say the uh, the other one I wanted to mention specifically is uh, the Alpha Direct 4008 is going to come in slate blue. Um, so if you've been able to find Alpha Direct out there, it has probably been in lame colors. Uh, this color is not lame, so you should check that out. Yeah, no, the colors are are pretty sweet. I'm a huge uh, kind of earth tones kind of guy. I don't really walk around wearing a lot of vibrant colors, uh, and I'm a huge fan of these. It's not to say that if you don't like vibrant colors, you can't have fun with these, especially like with purple haze and. Um, that's really the only one burnt orange as well i guess <laughs> yeah but uh you know they're fantastic and the performance will well pay off the colors yeah cool well isaac thank you for all the work that you spent getting these fabrics in house for us and for uh all the makers really pumped to see what you do stay tuned we're gonna chat with a bunch of makers here in just a minute So by now, a lot of you know that we try to be one of the go-to resources for MYOG subjects. In a lot of areas, we can do that pretty well. However, in this area, apparel making especially, we're actually not that experienced at this yet. Isaac's made some stuff, Carter's made one or two pieces, and I've made basically nothing. And that is where our guests come in. So we're bringing in a few makers that have made a lot of apparel, that have a lot of experience with some of these fabrics that we'll be bringing on shortly. So we want you to leave this episode being a little bit more experienced or a little bit more confident in making with Polar Tech Fabrics, and we're going to get you there in just a moment. But first, our guests. So one of the first people, this is their first time on the episode, but not new to the community at all. They have a flair and a vibrance about their design that has gained a lot of popularity and is super exciting. So modeled similarly to things like the best-selling Patagonia Cinchilla, these designs are not just homemade, but they're also truly one of a kind. Sam, welcome to the episode. Thanks for having me. I feel like I already know you. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast <laughs> a lot in the last few weeks, and we've never met, but your voice is very familiar. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> And it's kind of full circle, Sam, because we've done a few of the maker question episodes. And I remember on one of our very first ones, I think you sent us in a question that we answered. Yeah, so. really early on, I think I asked, I think I asked a question about uh, like rain jacket material or something. And I think it was even before I had <laughs> Sam Bob as, as my um, business name. And I had a different Instagram account. And so it was really early on in, in all of this. Also new on the episode, founder of Hightail Designs. Hightail is notable for their eccentric designs, but also uh, a lot of experience with printing on some really cool fabrics with stuff from photographers and designers, all sorts of crazy stuff. Welcome to the podcast, Connor. Hi, it's great to meet y'all. Very excited to learn. I'm taking notes over here. So. <laughs> 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 and last but not least, our last guest is a good friend of the podcast, and this is now his second time on the podcast. We have Tim from Learn MYOG. Thank you for being back, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to hear from y'all. I like to refer to Tim as the, uh, the Internet's MYOG tutor, but also now with your expertise in all sorts of patterns. I'm going to tub you the pioneer of patterns as well for some oh, fun geez, alliterations. No. <laughs> no. There's a lot of people doing it a lot better than I am. <laughs> Great. Well, we've kind of broken up this segment of the podcast into a few different sections. So we'll just kick it off with a few icebreakers here. Um, what is everyone's favorite apparel item to make? I guess I'll go first. Um, 
I have a lot of fun working on our uh, Alpha Direct 90 and 120 hoodies. And actually, the most fun is to work with the 190 because it's just, it's the least stretchy and like ethereal to sew with. Um, <laughs> it like holds the shape basically. Uh, but it's just fun because you get to use so many of the machines that we don't like. Usually, if I'm sewing Dyneema, I'm using like the lock stitch and that's it. Um, but we get to use like the flat lock, the zigzag. Um, we have like an elastic tensioner that's pneumatic. Um, Yeah, and we have, like, different sergers that we use to stick on the elastic. I don't know. It's fun to just, like, bounce around when you get tired of, like, working with stuff sacks every day and <laughs> sewing <laughs> fanny packs every day, so. Yeah, I think for me, uh, working with the gridded Polar Tech is probably the my, fa my favorite material, but it's usually, for me, it's used in the crew necks that I'm making or the baby onesies that I do, and those are... Those are sort of a sort of second line of products that I've come out with um, after the the pullovers that I started with, and so they're still feeling a little bit new and they're pr pretty quick to make, um, as opposed to the pullovers take a lot more time and they're sort of more detailed work, and so they're kind of fun to be able to just sort of pump out. And the baby the baby ones are always very cute to just imagine or then put on my baby and. Um, yeah, so it's always it's always a fun photo shoot um, with those things, at least. I love seeing those on my feed every day. <laughs> like, immediate, like... Yeah, yeah, Lucian is getting a lot of FaceTime, um, whether he wants it or not. Right yeah. yeah, so for me, probably the, the thing that's most fun is doing the little hats. Um, just because it's, you know, very little material, and they're fast to make, and, uh, you know, something you can immediately take out and, and wear or whatever, but... Um, you know, just the, the amount of material it takes to do it is just you can use up scraps and things like that and be real creative with the different hats. But uh, those are pretty fun to make. So each of you has maybe a little bit more expertise with certain variants than others. Uh, you've dabbled in a lot of them, but I kind of want each of you to touch on one of the aspects, one of the attributes of the fabric that you work with the most that you like the most. So Connor, for you, uh, Hightail Designs puts out some really cool alpha hoodies. What about alpha? For those of people that aren't familiar with the performance of the fabric, what's one of the attributes that you really like about that fabric? Well, it's got to be the breathability. Like you're you're able to wear it, or at least I don't know. I, I wear it like the whole trip that I'm out, like sleeping during the day. I just don't take it off, and I'm never like overheating. Even if you're hiking up, you know, a huge climb, you don't need to take it off. It'll just breathe right through. And then when you get to camp, you just stop moving so air is not moving through it and you just warm up instantly. Like, it's not great if it's super windy, but you just stick a shell on. And I don't know, I run pretty hot, so I, I can get away with, like, the 90 or 120 down to, like, 30, 40 degrees. So it's I just love how breathable it is. It's great. Tim, for you, you've used a lot of the a lot of the fabrics, but let's uh, go with the, the the grid for you. What about the grid? Has a really what, what aspect do you like most about it? Uh, I guess one thing is it's pretty easy to sew, pretty forgiving, and uh, it's not super it's not overly stretchy. Um, it's and it's super soft, super comfortable. Um, so yeah, while Alpha Direct is fantastic when you're exercising because of that breathability, when you you know, you just want something to maybe casually or to wear around town, but it also can, you know, suffice out in the out in the back country. Uh, power grids and just other grid fleeces are are really great. You don't always have to have a backup for it, um, and some of them have DWRs and things like that. So they're, you know, pretty versatile fabric that uh, that isn't as advanced as Alpha Direct is, and just has a little bit more versatility for for various uses, not just out and out and hiking things like that. Yeah, that's sort of similar to what I was thinking with the gridded fleece fabric that I use. It's a really nice weight. It's something that you can wear in the shoulder season or on a cool summer night. And a lot of my stuff is not necessarily intended for backpacking trips even. Like some people do take some of these pieces on backpacking trips, but they're often more of just sort of a casual outdoor wearing um, item. But Somebody did just finish the CDT wearing one of my pullovers um, made from the gridded fabric. So it definitely can be used in that way. And, you know, the CDT is pretty, pretty
pretty rough, and so I was pretty excited to see that he actually, I think he hiked like 2,500 miles with it and um, did pretty well. So, yeah, I think the gridded fabric generally is sort of a nice hybrid that you can use sort of in your normal everyday life, like Tim said, and also it's a great material to have out there um, in the wild. Sam, can you also talk to the more traditional fleece and what attributes you like about that one? Yeah, well, one thing is that it often comes in a lot more colors, so that's sort of where where I've gone a little crazy, and I have you know twenty five different um, solid colors to offer for people, and um, it is it's often a bit thicker, and so it's more of a I would say a, at least what I'm using is like a one or two hundred um, classic polar plush fleece, and um, I find that it's often a little too warm. Uh, it's not really a summer garment, but um, we're getting into that season where people are eager to cozy up to these um, color, colorful items. Um, yeah, and generally, it's just really forgiving. I mean, fleece in general, I think, is not maybe not alpha, but uh, the gridded stuff and the more classic just polar plush stuff is, I mean, it's honestly, I haven't done a ton of sewing with much else than fleece like when i started i started with fleece and i'm still working with fleece and i have some you know random side projects but um generally i find it just super forgiving which is great for a beginner um especially i think yeah you just like that punishment of having to cut all that fleece and all that fuzz everywhere (laughs) yeah the fluff is a nightmare um Well, clearly you're all very skilled apparel makers, but I'm curious to know, what is the first apparel item you ever made? Mine was a dog raincoat. (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) I guess a t-shirt. I mean, I, after school, I went to Virginia Tech for industrial design And I found a job. I just wanted to sew when I got out. And I found a job in Christiansburg, Virginia, at like a custom dye sub and cut and sew apparel manufacturer. And we just like they were just starting their cut and sew operations. So they brought me on as like a main sewer. But we were just like figuring it out on the go and just bought a bunch of like jukies. And we immediately got orders for like tons of T-shirts, tons of leggings, like all like white label stuff at the time. Um, so probably like shirts and leggings, like not outdoor gear, basically. It was like the first thing I learned how to sew as a garment, basically. Yeah, my first thing was uh, just a pair of shorts. I was just, I, I was visiting a friend and we brought an old uh, sewing machine and wanted to learn and she just, you know, it was an easy pattern, just a, a few pieces and, um, so we showed, sewed up a pair of shorts, and then I quickly was like, why not make some fleece shorts? Um, obviously, that's the next the next thing to do. Um, everyone loves fleece shorts. No, but, uh, and then a bunch of my friends wanted them, and so I got some practice in fleece shorts before I um, really got into anything else. But, um, yeah, shorts. Tim, I'm glad That's you funny. mentioned the that, dog raincoat because I had never thought about dog apparel, but I've definitely done that too. So you're already making me feel better. <laughs> yeah, mine was just a PU coated dog raincoat because we moved out here to Seattle. We got tired of you know drying them off after every little walk, so raincoat was pretty pretty clutch. But Sam, that's pretty good. You started with shorts. Shorts were my nemesis. I could never get shorts to fit. So yeah, shorts are tough. I mean, I've stopped making them because to make them for the general random person who orders like yeah i mean i I often say people ask like why i'm not making them anymore and usually my answer is butts i mean just (laughs) everyone's everyone's a little bit different and you know everyone's i think the the tops are a little easier because you're make you know often it's a unless you're really doing a fitted item um it's easy to make tops that are more loose fitting which is what a lot of people are looking for for layering and things like that now, I need to give a little bit of background for this question. The question is, what kind of machine did you use to make some of those apparel items, use some of your first items? But the background for us is that we're trying to help people get into and kind of gateway into uh, into apparel items. Not everybody has a plethora of sergers and finishing machines and apparel machines and stuff like that. Um, so we're really encouraging people that at first, you're probably going to have a home machine and, and you know, getting through some of these intro kits or some of these intro projects with a a home machine can get you 
far enough. But in your personal experiences, um, Sam, let's, let's start with you again. What was the first machine that you used to make those pair of those those uh, those shorts? Um, it was this little brother machine back here. Uh, it was under two hundred dollars, and um, I ended up probably making like a hundred pullovers on this thing too. Um, and then, and then when I went into the the sewing machine. Uh, repair shop they kind of laughed me out of the room because they were like you can't be like doing hundreds of items on of like sort of thick fleece and then not cleaning it and like i had no idea what i was doing but it did well and you can make you can make a ton of stuff with a, a really cheap machine like this mm -hmm. um and so for me it was just sort of it was a cheap cheap thing to buy um and it worked great and it still does i, I use it for labels now but yeah tim what about you yeah, I mean, I used a handy down sewing machine that my mom gave me. It's a old domestic, you know, Kenmore machine. Nowadays, I just use it for buttonholes. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the big thing for most people is that they should learn the stitch types that are on the machine. Don't be scared to turn that little knob and select the right stitch and read the manual. Uh, you know, zigzag stitch is great for a lot of things, and you know, but your machine likely has an overcast and maybe even has a stretch stitch. And just learning those stitch types of when to use them and experimenting with them, you know, goes a long way. So yeah, I, I think a lot of people like to find the, the, the tool that makes the job the easiest rather than spending the time and just developing a skill with what you got on hand. Yeah, I actually started on the exact same brother too. Uh, that's a great machine. Um, I don't have a ton of experience on like home sergers or anything, but I will say we do see like used Juki DDL 8700s go onto eBay for like not that much, not that much more than a home sewing machine would cost. So you can you can check eBay and every once in a while you'll see like you know like a, a sewing machine repair company that's going out of business just puts them all up for dirt cheap so that's a good place if you're looking for like cheap industrial machines um, check eBay or you know search around um, but yeah you definitely don't need to start on one it just the, the benefit is that it doesn't vibrate quite so much that's like all like that's like the main thing and it's like more consistent and it'll go longer without breaking. So, but you can do almost the, the stitches look the same when it's all said and done. It's just like cycle times running it all day long. You wouldn't want to use the home machine for too many years. You can try. You're good. I was just going to say that I love that with Tim and Sam's machine, you started with it, but you didn't get rid of it. You just gave it a new job. You're like, oh, you're just for buttonholes or I just do the labels with it. It's it's nice that it's still in the family. <laughs> on the, the last episode that you were on, Tim, we talked about some of the fears of MIOG and it was largely like intro DIY uh, geared. If we're pretending like this is intro to apparel, what are some of those stitches on a machine that you would want someone to look for if they're getting a home machine that also had some apparel options or if they're apparel curious let's say <laughs> yeah so it's really the you know most of this most of the construction seams you're going to do is just going to be a lock stitch right and once you start getting into more of the stretch fabrics especially fleece and things like that you're going to want a little bit of a stretch stitch so almost all machines nowadays are going to have a zigzag stitch that you can use so a, a narrow zigzag will get you a long way uh, for seam finishing if you don't want to do be binding seams especially with like fleece and stuff then a an overcast stitch, and there's usually a special foot for it that makes it a little easier, but you can do that with a zigzag if you don't have the specialty stitch. And then the last one that's a little newer that's out there now is a stretch stitch, and it looks like little lightning bolts. And that's really good for like the really, really stretchy knit fabrics that you're doing like leggings and things like that. So, you know, you can find those in the, you know, the cheapest machines that are out there nowadays, just because these domestics, both the computerized and the mechanicals, you know, they're they're geared for people who are they don't necessarily know what they want to do. They want something that's kind of a do it all machine. And that's what those domestics are fantastic for. Right. Once you know that this is what I really like to do and I that machine, I'm kind of out of its cap you know, capability. That's when you really need to start looking at, you know, higher class machines or or more expensive or specialty machines. Um, but your your standard domestic computer or mechanical machine probably has the stitches that uh, will be a lot more capable than you're going to be when you first get started. That's for sure. Another sort of plug for home machines. Um, I think my instinct with a lot of hobbies and just aspects of my life are like, you want the best thing. And so maybe spend a lot of money initially because it's a good investment. So maybe you get an industrial machine because I know I'm really into this. But I think 
one thing about home machines is that you can bring them into a sewing machine repair shop and get help. And um, with an industrial machine, it's a lot harder to do that. Um, so even if you're really sure that you want to be in this hobby, um, I think a home machine is a great thing to have just for learning purposes. And they can be super cheap. Um, so it's a great place to start. And you can make, you know, everything on it. Yeah, there's something to be said for being able to carry your machine to a, a dealer that not only are they going to be able to help you out and repair it, but those people that are there are going to see you as a, you know, your audience, very much a young person walking in with a showing machine, and they're just, they're going to be willing to help you with all the questions. And, you know, you're probably going to hear more than you wanted to hear from them, but, you know, they're going to teach you all their bad habits. But, uh, you know, there's, it's a, it's an easy way to get help when you walk into a dedicated sewing place and you're there with your own machine asking for help. You know, there's going to be a lot of people there willing to jump in. Absolutely. So I would love to know at what point everyone felt more confident in making apparel. Maybe it was, you know, kind of graduating out of your basic machine, or maybe it was that you mastered doing buttons. But what was that moment for you where you felt like just super capable and confident in your apparel making abilities? Everyone's thinking. For y'all, it's got to be seeing people wearing your stuff. I mean, yeah. mine, it's seeing people that make something with something I designed and, you know, being like, hey, I, I got it to fit me and I wear it out in public. And people said they liked it. Right? That's, that's pretty yeah. motivating and definitely builds confidence. Yeah, I think you're right. I think for me, it was when people, I was able to communicate with people about what they wanted and about what size they were and what, what they're looking for in a fit. And then I send it off to them and they love it. You know, and that a lot of the times you don't hear back from people like, you know, 95% of the people I send stuff to, I never hear from again. So when you do actually hear back from someone that they love something and they wear it all the time, um, that really helps with the confidence, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like getting feedback, I think, makes you pretty confident about the gear you're making. But I don't know, like, it depends on what you define as making, like sewing it, I'm confident but I, I don't know like it's it's very hard to feel like super confident in your grading and sizing like i think that just takes a lifetime like of trial and error and then tweaking it you know what who's your audience who are you selling it to it's that's that's something that like we're we're getting there but um yeah it takes a long time <laughs> yeah yeah, that, that is definitely tough is having an audience and knowing that the, you know, the different pattern grades you've come out with are actually going to fit people, right? Yeah. Everyone's going to be like, well, I wear a size medium. Like that means literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, like, yeah, every brand has different, different audiences and different grades. And, you know, so yeah, it's that, that is definitely a tough one. And uh, there's people that specialize, you know, that's their whole, that's their whole specialty they do for a living is, is pattern grading. But um, I think the big thing is, you know, knowing that you can construct something yourself is great, but knowing that someone else can can either wear what you've made or follow along with what you've designed, that's that's pretty inspiring, I guess. So, Tim, I'm on a, I guess I'll give you, I know you have wonderful insight, but I'll give you the softball of where should people start when making apparel items? <laughs> Um, I actually think one of the easier patterns, at least that I that I have out there to make, is a just a straight up pullover. Um, right? There's a lot of different fabrics you can use with it, and... You know, there's there's no zipper down the middle, right? There's very little seam finishing you got to deal with. Um, so just a straight pullover. It can be a, you know, a sun hoodie. It can be a insulated hoodie. You can use Alpha Direct. You can use, you know, you can use whatever you want, really, uh, as long as it has the stretch. You know, as long as it follows the fabric you pick matches the stretch for the that it's been designed for. I think that's a pretty straightforward, you know, a raglan sleeve, you know, straight up hoodie. Pretty Pretty simplistic to do. So, yeah, I would say um, just keep in mind that, like, certain things are not as they seem, like, when you start to sew it. Uh, for instance, like, your collar is not the same circumference as the neck opening. It has to be smaller or else it's just going to stand up off your chest. There's little stuff like that, like tweaking the arm side, which is, like, the two complex curves that need to make the arm cap if you're sewing, like, a T-shirt or something. A, a small changes in that can really affect the fit. Um, so especially if you're making shirts, pay, pay some attention to how changes in that curve really affect how it fits on your shoulders, how it fits in the back. Um, you know, stuff like that, just little pattern tweaks, you know, tweak it till you get it right. 
Sam, what about you? What would you recommend? Shorts, obviously. <laughs> Just kidding. Definitely not shorts. Um, I mean, I don't know. My my second sort of pro- bigger project was uh, an insulated wind jacket, um, which, you know, I, I made, and it didn't fit that well, but I was able to follow the pattern. I mean... I don't know. I, I think that the biggest start is just sort of figuring out how to read a pattern. I feel like you can kind of, if, if the pattern is made well and the instructions are there, you can try to make anything. And you have to just be willing to know that it's not necessarily going to be a great fit or um, parts of it aren't going to look the way you want it to. But like you guys have talked about in other episodes, just making mock-ups and buying cheap material to make um, your first thing before you dive into that sort of dream material that you bought from Ripstop or whatever. Um, Yeah. I I think that sort of there's, uh, there's some basic skills of just like how to read a pattern and what, um, how to follow the instructions that um, most people will be able to sort of start with most basic things. I mean, you know, there's some complicated (laughs) things that you're not going to want to start with, but um, you definitely want to you definitely want to start with the worst fabric you can find that closestly acts as a facsimile to the fabric you're going to be using. So if you're going to make something out of Dyneema, use like Jacqueline or something. If you're going to make uh, an alpha hoodie, just find some thick, like stretchy knit fabric. Like definitely don't don't even look at the nice fabrics until you're like you've messed up a bunch of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you're really worried, make a scarf or a buff. Yeah. Right? And just get used to the machine. Right? So some straight lines and finish some edges. You'll have a functional piece of gear, and then you can move on to something more complicated. And definitely, you know, you don't have to design the pattern yourself. I know a lot of people look at this stuff, and they're like, oh, I should just design it from scratch. Like, you know, rely on the people that have done it a little bit before. And certainly yeah. it makes sense for me to say go follow a pattern. But, <laughs> you know, you can, go, you can go anywhere and pick up a sewing pattern, right, and find something you like and just sit down and follow it. Um, Isaac and, and Carter give me endless amount of crap because I, I never follow a pattern. Like a huge part of NYOG for me is the, the fun of trying to solve the problems that I've created. Mm-hmm. And although that is a, not the most ideal way to go about things, if you want to end up with a finished product, it's kind of what I, I get a lot of joy out of doing. Um, but I'm so glad that you mentioned Sam specifically learning how to read a pattern. Cause I could totally see myself going to get like Tim's patterns and be like, awesome. I'm going to come out with a perfect piece of gear straight away. And then immediately getting super, super lost, even though all the work is actually done and it's done really, really well. I'm not experienced reading patterns. That's a great reminder for myself, but also everybody else to get, to get ready ahead of time. Um, I'll just say that won't happen if you pick up one of my patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Even I, it's actually it is kind of funny though because before you released the DS shorts, Tim, I it was maybe summer of twenty last summer I think. Carter Isaac and I were outside of our office and we were playing around during lunchtime. We just got super super sweaty, um, and it was one of those like actually I think it was shoulder season. It was fall or spring because I was wearing like jeans and then we got kind of sweaty. And I was going to sit down. I don't really want to wear jeans for the rest of the day being all sweaty. Uh, so I very uh, overzealously was like, hey, I'm going to make a pair of shorts really quick before we go back to, to work. And they rapidly turned into just like a hype, like a one six hyper D like skirt. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> you wear it? Uh, I did for uh, until I got dry. So too long, really. <laughs> Now you're starting to sound like a through hiker, Jameson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to probably be alone in this, but I reason. learned how to sew in high school. And the project they always started us out with was PJ pants. You just can't get any mm-hmm. more classic than like a Joanne's flannel PJ pant. <laughs> yep. yep. It, it's just... You know, if you want it to fit a certain way, it can be a lot of a lot of work. Pants pants are not easy, like Sam said. It's uh, everyone has a pant the way they want the pants to fit, and it can be pretty tough. But yeah, yeah, you know, like you said, an elastic elastic waist pants that don't have a zipper, pretty straightforward. That being said, like it took me of- probably ten different pairs of those <laughs> Dia shorts to get it right. So I've got a lot of those sitting around that are not for public because they do, <laughs> do not fit very well. <laughs> 
I feel like we're segueing pretty great into our next question, which is what has been the most difficult part you've encountered in apparel making? It might be pants. It might be zippers. It could be sizing. Yeah. I think the sizing is for me, it's just, <laughs> it's something I'm constantly sort of toiling with internally. I've sort of established a system now, but I still don't trust, I still worry about it every time somebody orders something, especially if it's somebody that I know, you know, there's a lot of people who buy stuff from me that I, they're just complete strangers and I never hear from them again. But if it's like a close friend or a family member and, uh, you know, I, I will hear from them if it doesn't fit. Um, I think I, from the start, wanted to have unisex sizing, um, which just complicates things, but I think it's a nice way to sort of be more inclusive um, and just a way to try to get people something that fits and not um, incorporate gender into it at all. Um, and so as a result, I sort of have what maybe is traditionally women's and, and traditionally men's sizing, but um, I have different terminology and it's not exactly sort of split into those. Um, it's sort of more like long and short and people can kind of combine um, lengths for sleeves and torso and things like that. Um, and it's worked pretty well, but it's something that I think you'd struggle with with any product that you make um, if it's if it's a piece of apparel, it's just, everyone's different. And um, it is reassuring to know that, you know, large companies like Patagonia and whoever else uh, also struggle with this because not everyone likes the, you know, there's not a universal sizing system. I use, you find this out, especially when you have kids where, you know, the zero to three month for one brand is actually fits a, a nine month old baby. Um, and it's, it seems ludicrous, but it's just the reality of apparel um, in general, that sizing is just a challenge. Yep. Yep. So what was yeah. the original question? Something we struggle with? Is that what you asked? Yeah. The most difficult thing that you've encountered when making apparel. Yeah. So probably the thing I'm like, that always just is a pain for me is the final hems on things like shorts, short, hem, you, know, you know, either a waist hem or like doing the hems on shorts. It's like the last step and these stretch fabrics. It's like the minute you st it starts pulling weird and all that stuff. It's like, yeah. Oh my gosh, like I'm literally done. Just, I want to get this last hem done and you get this wonky finish and it gets all curved and stuff. And so yeah, hemming for me is like the, my least favorite thing other than cutting, cutting sucks, but hemming is hemming is just, uh, that's, I just wish it would just be so much easier to do a nice hem. Yeah, cutting cutting definitely stinks. We used to cut all of our stuff by hand. So, like, back before it was high tail, like, thousands of leggings and shirts all cut by hand. I have, like, pretty gnarly tendonitis in my elbow from it. But we have a laser cutter now, so that's resolved some of that. But I don't know. The, the, thing, the thing I always struggle with the most is adding, like, elastic to stuff because you want it to, like, be equally stretched around the mm -hmm. circumference of whatever you're putting it in. And there's just not a great way to do that by hand, except by feel. And there's also not a lot of great machines that do it. We we now have like this convoluted contraption that like pneumatically tensions the elastic, and then there's another tensioner to like pull it off the roll at a consistent rate because the roll is heavy. It's just a mess. Like adding elastic to stuff is is one of my least favorite things. Mm -hmm. Market elastic, so figure out what you want the like settled circumference to be on whatever it is, the neck, or I guess you wouldn't do it on the neck, but the, like a wrist opening and then just mark out the sewn sleeve into quadrants and mark out the elastic into quadrants. And then as you're sewing, just stretch it and match the little tick marks going around. You know, you can even do six or eight tick marks if you're really particular about it, but you know, measure once, cut twice. <laughs> See rip three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that is that's, how I, that's how I Yeah, that's how I do my elastic, you know. I, I mark it in quadrants and then on waist if it's, you know, it's a big diameter, then I'll do mark it into eights and then pin it, clip it those many times and then pre-stretch and then try to try to keep it consistent. 
but yeah, it's that it, that is tough without a specialty machine doing it uh, doing it by hand. This it's is definitely doable. Shouldn't let, shouldn't make it shouldn't be something that stops you from doing it. It's just it, it takes practice. Yeah, this is perfect because I want to get more into some of the technical side of of making apparel. So tips on how to put elastic on is awesome. But let's talk about cutting a little bit. Uh, do normal scissors do well? Should people be worried about adding any more uh, tools to their toolkit when making with apparel or cutting apparel or anything like that? I would just use a rotary blade um, for almost anything. Um, I don't know, like a good pair of like, uh, is it Ginger or Ginger? I don't, I don't remember the name, but it's like a nice brand of scissors. Uh, those are great to have around, but if I'm cutting like a flat pattern, I want a cutting mat and a rotary blade and just keep like a handful of the blades on you. Um, you can buy the knockoff ones. They're, they're all the same thing. They all come from the same factory. You don't need to buy the Ulfa ones. Just buy, buy anyone on Amazon. They're, they're great. Um, yeah, cutting rotary blade and then snips for like very small stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. I use rotary blade and those scissors you're talking about. And then I do have like thread trimmers that are good for trimming thread. But also if you're if you have notches in your pattern that you want to be marking places in the fabric, you can just use those to like trim to snip the, the notches. Um, yeah, definitely. Be liberal about changing your blade and sharpening your blades if you're doing enough that you need to. Because there's a number of times where I just haven't, I've just realized it's been a while since I've changed my rotary blade, blade. And once you do, it's a whole new world. It's just, it's it's wonderful to have a new blade because it makes it makes your life a lot a lot easier. Um, it is quite dangerous, but it's um, it's they're they're so sharp. But they a fresh blade will um, keep you sane. I think. Have yeah, you... in the same boat. I use a rotary cutter for everything, and the the biggest the biggest hassle with apparel is that the panels are the fabric panels get big. So it's like you buy two to three yards of fabric. It's like just if you're doing that on a little fold out table or your kitchen table or whatever. It's a lot to just manage the material and lay those lay those out, and especially if you're cutting stuff on folds and things like that. It's you know it can be kind of tough. So getting a bigger cutting mat than you think you need is probably a good thing to do, and then. Uh, you know, until you have a nice table to work on, you're probably going to be doing it on the floor. So have something, something for underneath your knees. But. It is kind of a weird in between, isn't it? Like we, uh, we hear a lot about people that are <clears throat> talking about making bivvies or tents in their house and they're like taking up their entire living room. And it's not quite that size, but it's also probably bigger than a lot of people's tables or their sewing tables, at least, you know, yeah. <laughs> like a, a hoodie is not going to be the size of a standard desk. You have a, you know, a little bit more space. Or right. Help. Yeah. The other thing is that, you know, a lot of the polar tech fabrics have a lot of stretch, right? So you want to be able to, you don't want that hanging off the end of the table because it starts to really warp the fabric. So you got to have a way to, you know, keep the, where you're cutting to be not under tension and uh, manage that, manage the stretch of the fabric as you're cutting stuff out. So I, I envy you guys. I see the, the big machines you guys have and the giant cutting tables and things you have. And I'm, every time I see it, I'm like, if I wasn't in my basement. <laughs> 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 I envy the laser cutter for sure. We still have to like, hand cut anything that's bigger than the laser bed because we don't have like a continuous scan cutter. So it doesn't like cut and roll the belt at the same time. So it's just easier to lay it out and cut it the old fashioned way. Um, and I realize this is sort of an aside, but uh, it does have to do with cutting. Uh, for anyone who's cutting Dyneema or any of those laminates where it just dulls the blade so quickly and it's like, driving you insane that you're wasting so many blades get those cutting mats that are like blue on the one side with the grid and then gray on the other side like they're not double-sided and cut on the gray side because the dyneema won't sink into the cut like when the blade gets too dull it'll push into the mat and push the dyneema into the mat but not cut it so try that out cut on the back side of the mat and then also fresh out of the box the blade has a bunch of burrs on it just cut a bunch of scrap fabric real fast to knock off all those burrs and it'll cut right through Dyneema like butter. That's something that we we wasted hundreds of blades trying to figure out <laughs> what's going on with this. And turns out you need a dull one, I guess. <laughs> a duller one. 
Yeah, that's good insight. I see yeah. a lot of people on on Reddit always asking, "How the heck do you cut all this? All these things with Dyneema fabrics in them?" And Ultra Ultra is the other one. People are constantly like, "How do I cut this stuff?" It sounds like, counterintuitive. Just don't buy it. <laughs> knock knock the burrs off it. Cut it. Cut some like the most plasticky polyester thing you can find, and just keep cutting it over and over and over. And I don't know what it does. It's like magic. It just makes the blade cut Dyneema like butter. Wow. I love all these hot tips that you guys are giving. I know people are going to be really excited about it. Um, what are some finishing tips or techniques that you think other people should know about? I don't want to put anyone on the spot first because I feel like you're all kind of looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can definitely use um, like bias binding, which is it's like a binding tape that's cut on the bias. So the fibers, the warp and weft are 45 degrees through the tape, which lets it kind of contour around things better than like a straight across like webbing type material. Um, that's what we use. We use like a just unfolded one inch or one and a quarter inch binding tape. And then we run it through a little folder like this. Um, they're like, double eagle brand folders. Um, I realize it's not going to show up on that audio side. <laughs> but, um, yeah, finishing things with binding is good. Or um, like Tim was mentioning, a zigzag will get you. I mean, I still prefer the zigzag, honestly. Like our alpha direct hoodies don't have binding because I like the plain silhouette. Um, they're just zigzagged. Yeah, I use, um, like for the cuffs, I use a uh, like a stretch binding that I get from uh, Quest Outfitters. Um, they used to have more colors, but now they just have black. Um, and it's a. It took me a while to find it, so I'd, so I'd send people over there to get it because it's um, it's kind of exactly what you envision on the, the cuff of a Patagonia or LL Bean or something. Um, I also use it on the the collar, the hood, um, sort of exterior of the hood is just a finish. Um, and the nice thing about fleece is it's not going to unravel on you, so you don't even always need to finish things. It's going to look a lot better if you do hem it with a zigzag or something, but it's not going to come apart on you. Um, well, depends on the fleece, I guess. Alpha is, like, sh more sheddy, and I've run into a few other sort of, um, like, high loft polar techs that do shed, but generally it's, 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 it's nice in that you don't have, have as much to worry about with finishing. I have no tips for finishing. You just got to practice it and <laughs> find the materials that work for you. Fold over elastics, cheap and easy to use. That's a, a great alternative to, you know, to cutting specialty binding and using folders and things. Uh, just a fold over elastic and pin it and zigzag it. That works great. Um, that's kind of what I recommend on all the patterns just because it's easy to get started there and you can get it in all kinds of different colors and patterns. Um, but yeah, I guess the other kind of um, tip about just doing things better is buy nice thread. Don't go buy that cheap thread that you see at the craft store. You know, you know, you can get Gutterman also at the, at the craft store. That's the equivalent of the Mara 100. And that is great stuff. That's the only stuff I'll buy like at a Joann's or whatever is the, is the Gutterman so all, but uh, especially with a surger, you want to use a nice thread. Um, you know, don't just buy the, the 99 cent cone of thread just cause it's not going to work. It's just not going to, it, it's going to be a, a headache to use it. So for the surgers, I use the maxi lock. That's another Gutterman product, but, uh, but yeah. Perfect. That actually takes me into my next question, which was <laughs> what needle and thread everyone recommended. I know that I get this question a few times every day running social media, and I know that people have their preferences on thread, and it's also the one question people are always, it'll just hang someone up in their project. They get really excited, and they're like, oh, my God, but what do I use? So... <laughs> Tim's got the maxi lock. What about you, Sam? Um, I don't even know what I use. The the, the <laughs> serger thread I, I have is I just order from the uh, company that I bought the serger from um, in Texas, uh, Sunny Sewing. Uh, I use the Gooderman thread for my other machines, um, and yeah, that works great. Um, 
same thing with the needles. I'm not very like up on my specs on those, but um, I just have a bunch that I got early on when I got the machines. Yeah, we use Mara for almost everything at the shop, including on the Alpha Direct hoodies. We use Mara as the needle threads because it's stronger than like a spun thread. Uh, but for the looper thread, which is like the part that'll be contacting your skin the most, we use Puma, which is like uh, an extruded thread, and a couple other variants from, yeah, Gutterman and uh, American Eford. We use like E181 or 151 and E382. It's just some soft thread for anything touching the skin. Like some of that Mara could be real rough if it's like a base layer. Um, but if it's just a needle thread, you're not ever going to feel it. Um, and then we use, I don't know, like those gross Becker needles, sharps. Um, I think the size we use is like a 65, which is pretty, pretty thin. I know a lot of people don't like using them, but we're mostly sewing Dyneema, and I don't like the huge holes in it, so I'd rather stick with a smaller needle. And it doesn't really matter with the fleece because it's – at least for us, it's just a lattice weave, so you're not poking holes in it anyway. You're just sewing around it, so to speak. Yeah, I think for most home users, uh, just a universal needle kit. Just go buy the little bundle, and it'll usually have 11, 12, and maybe a 14-size needle in it. They're usually – the universal is fine. It's a good blend between a ball and a sharp. And uh, for apparel, it's, it works fine. Um, if you are using fleece, technically you should be probably using a ball needle on a domestic machine, but – if you only have regular point needles, just use those. Um, if you find that, you know, the thing that is kind of tough is if you have uh, some of the stretchy fabrics and uh, elastic fabrics, um, a, a sharp needle, you might start getting, the, it just won't sew very well, and your seams, the, the stitches all That's just won't, uh, won't connect. So a ball needle will work better generally for you. Um, so, yeah, if you're, if you're buying a, you know, if you're just using a domestic machine, just buy the little Singer Universal kit and, you know, that'll work for pretty much everything you're going to, that you're going to be sewing with that machine. I know this one wasn't <laughs> planned, but I'm just curious because we've talked about it before on previous podcast episodes, but can you hear when a needle needs to be changed? Some people can, and some people can't, and I just need to know. <laughs> I think you can with the right fabric. Uh, I think still, still nylons is pretty clear. You get this really loud slapping noise. Uh, same thing with the VX 21s and things like it makes a very loud clicking slapping noise. And, uh, that's generally a case where you need a sharper needle. Um, with, I can't tell with fleece and, and knits and things like that. Cause it's just, yeah, you just don't hear it. I don't, at least I don't think. Yeah. I pretty much only sew fleece and I definitely can't tell. <laughs> The serger makes way more noise than the needles yeah. through the fabric does. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I can definitely tell when it's, like, not sewing correctly, when the machine's not creating a proper stitch. I don't know if I can always tell when it uh, needs to be replaced. Um, might just be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> when, we talked, when we talked with the sewing machine mechanic, I think both Avery and I like during the episode and then after the episode we looked at each other and we're like yeah we don't change our needle nearly enough as we should apparently <laughs> no i don't yeah, either yeah. i wait till they break <laughs> yeah. like every day for like manufacturing i'm like i'm not gonna do that every day yeah, yeah. i'm not gonna do it <laughs> nope so while we have all three of you here do you have any questions for each other i know this is a super unplanned part and i feel like the listeners gotten a ton of really good info but Again, you all three are here. Some of you haven't met before. What questions do you have for each other as people that make other apparel than you or just interesting questions you have while we're here? Well, I'll take the opportunity. Connor, go ahead. (laughs) Connor, go ahead, Connor. I was just going to ask you, Tim, um, if you had any tips on, like, offering, like, how you go about putting out uh, MYOG patterns. I've, like, debated... You know, we made silly stuff that we don't sell here all the time. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't really want to sell this, but I it would be fun if other people could make it. And I just don't really know where to start with, like, putting patterns up. Like, the, the formatting for it, like, I don't know. I don't really know anything about it, to be honest. So just wondering if you knew anywhere how to get started on that. Um, 
I don't really know. I have a good get started guide. I, you know, the, the resources that I kind of use was, um, I had a knowledge in uh, kind of the art programs. Uh, so illustrator type program. I don't use, I don't use Adobe illustrator, but that type of software to draw the patterns themselves. A lot of people use CAD or, you know, a lot of people are now getting into that 3d, 3d design stuff, which is just way too much time investment for me. But, um, you know, I think if you have the skill set to put the, put your design onto paper, then, uh, you know, really where the vast majority of the time ends up being is writing instructions. I mean, that just takes yeah. so, so long. Um, and I, I don't, there's nothing special I do with it. I use Google Docs and I create a, I just start typing in Google Docs. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you do have patterns or whatever, that's something that I, I've actually, I, I guess I'll throw it out there, right? I've, I've been trying to find ways to collaborate with people who have things that they want to share to the community. And, you know, I'd love to have the, the ability to, you know, rapidly be able to put different designs out there, especially in the free patterns, um, where it doesn't just take so long to, to really design it and document it so other people can follow it. Um, but because that's, that really is where the time investment is, uh, beyond just, you know, if you want to do video, video work is like by, by and large, the longest duration of capturing kind of a instruction <laughs> thing. Um, but yeah, if you have a design and, you know, you got it on paper and you want to digitize it and, you know, we can work together and, yeah, and put awesome. out a, Put out something to to get out, get out to the community. Then I, I certainly know the community will appreciate. It. They love free patterns and you know little projects they can do with small amount of fabrics. Awesome, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm really curious because I don't do any kind of like manufacturing or anything like that. But what have been some you know surprises that you guys have kind of learned from or lessons learned about taking something from making one or two of to making you know fifty of them? Like, what are some of the surprising things that you have kind of learned as you've gone through that process? Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I guess like most of my day is just spent trying to navigate units through sewing and like avoiding log jams. So spending a lot of time thinking about like when each step gets done, especially if you have a team of sewers, like you can't have one person finish and just, they need a batch from the other person and they're not done. So like, thinking of like how a product's going to move through the workflow and then almost not, not fully designing it around that, but like taking that into consideration when you're designing it. And then also like a lot of our stuff is seam taped. So designing for seam tape, mm -hmm. like I, if it, if it can't be seam tape, I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. If it's a, a lot of things, I mean, that's not the case with fleece and stuff, but you know, I just, stuff you wouldn't imagine you'd have to take into consideration when you're designing it, like becomes a much higher priority when you're pushing through hundreds of units. So that that's been a challenge this year and last year for sure. Yeah. My, I'm not nearly at the level that Connor is with the sort of scale of production. And, you know, I've sort of toyed with the idea of trying to scale up, but sort of quickly gets out of hand in terms of the, time investment and financial investment to go sort of beyond the one person level um, of even just hiring one other person, um, things that I think get complicated really fast. And so for me, it's been sort of figuring out what my capacity is based on the amount of time I have, the amount of space I have, all of that. And it does, it gets out of high hand pretty quick, you know, and you, you end up with these like every, you know, every corner of the building is covered, you know, sort of a little pile of fleece here, especially when you're offering a bunch of colors and um, yeah, sort of figuring out how to be the size business that you want to be is um, sometimes I think a challenge. Yeah. How, do, how, how dependent are you on social media? Is there a way around that? Like I find I spend way too much time on Instagram and I guess I'm curious, like, how do you cultivate, you know, a, a volume of sales without constantly having to deal with social? Yeah. Mine is like entirely social media. <laughs> yeah. Um, I communicate, I take orders through there. I mean, I do payments and stuff through the website and sometimes I'll just like make something that and put stuff on the website or do drops of like onesies or something. But, um, it's almost entirely like through Instagram where I, take orders through there or take reservations for orders and then communicate with people about what they want. And that's sort of, for me, it's still a positive. I still enjoy that. And that's actually sort of a big driver behind a lot of my interest in, in this is just 
you know, during the pandemic, especially, I, this is a way that I was like able to sort of have a small community and like just have yeah. some personal interactions that were outside of my house, um, even if they were just digital. Um, but it, it does get, it wears on you, especially when you're not feeling like coming up with content or posts or, you know, reels now, trying to do reels and stuff. It's, it can be hard. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, um, Avery, but uh, yeah. <laughs> seriously, Avery, <yeah. laughs> you know, it's a definitely, you can see why people hire social media yeah. managers. I mean, it's like, it's a legit skill and job and something that you don't always want to have to deal with if you're dealing with every other aspect of your business. Mm -hmm. Hey, Avery, you want to work for me for free? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll send you some pants or something. <laughs> I might. It's getting chilly where I live. <laughs> uh, you don't want to come over here then. It's cold. <laughs> Avery, I feel like you and I just got to become guests on our own podcast, and it was like the best thing ever. I didn't have to think of what to say for five minutes, and I just got to listen. It was great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, well I know that when fun. I... Sorry, you can start over. <laughs> <laughs> we we can't get synced up today. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. Hey, this has been super fun, everybody. I want to respect all of our time, um, and we we've kept you for about for about all of it. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us on this Polar Tech. For everyone listening, uh, check out Sam Bob and check out all his wonderful fleeces. Check out Connor at Hightail and check out Tim uh, from Learn M Y O G from patterns, pullovers, pants, shorts, you name it. These three guys have pretty much got it all. Um, plus, they're really wonderful guys to have on an episode. So all of you guys, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you all. Thank yeah, you. Nice getting to meet everyone. Cool. Well, now you're all friends of the podcast. Um, so we'll talk to you again soon. Feel free to let us know if there's anything that you guys need. <laughs>